very special guest yes, standing right next to me, Mr. Yes, President Wazi Guru. Uh, we have known each other since we were seven years old. Eh? <laughs> we've, been, we've been class buddies since grade two. Uh, then we went to United World Colleges. He went to the one in Italy. I went to the one in the U.S. in 1988. And then uh, we were in abroad for seven years, but he stayed longer, and uh, he uh, taught in different United World Colleges uh, and also a few other IB schools. So he's here to share his experience uh, living abroad as a teacher, uh, talk about different um, IB World schools he's uh, taught at, and uh, in general, just the experience abroad, and he'll try to connect that to the TOK. Okay? Uh, before we start, do you have any announcements? Uh, this is the only TFK sort of meeting for this week, right? So, but we will talk about what we learned here today. So, you know, this is not just a throwaway class. It's something that you have to co contemplate. <coughs> so, please pay attention. All right. All right. Right. Uh, now that you've taken your floor, let me take the floor. Anyway, um, as, as Dinesh Sar mentioned, we go back a long time, um, all the way to second grade, when you weren't even born. <laughs> so you wouldn't remember, obviously. And, what, uh, and I'm going to embarrass him now, because I can. <laughs> if... If he hadn't taken this job, do you know who would have been in his place? You. Yes, moi. As a matter of fact, he called me to say, hey, there's a job for you. <laughs> and he took it. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. That's not true. I said, I'm too busy. I was in Azerbaijan at the time, so I was too busy teaching kids like you outside of Nepal and still traveling, still moving around. Um, that was, Christ, 2009? Yeah. Eight? Eight, I think. Eight, nine, yeah. And um, I came back only in 2013, so I was no, I, I, I wasn't ready to come back. So um, it's just as well that he took it. Because it looks like you guys are taken very good care of. Right? Right. Okay. Um, to start my talk, I'm going to pick on a few of you. What's your name? Sonia. 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 Salina. Salina. Nopane. Any other Nopanes here? No? No Neopanes? Right, okay. Uh, Neopanes are Brahmins, right? Any other Brahmins here? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. All right, okay. Fair number, fair number. What's your name? Julia. 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 I go away for 25 years and Nepalese names are just, they should sound completely strange. Oh, Japanese, no wonder. No wonder. And I, I thought I was terrible at hearing and recognizing Nepalese names. All right, so you don't count, sorry. For this exercise, that is, not as an individual. What's your name? Tiring Lama. Tiring Lama. Okay. I can work with that name. <laughs> Any other Lamas here? All right. One other Lama. So, two. All right. Three. Three. Okay. Um, where are you from? Boda. Boda. And Lama, is that Tamang? Tibetan. Tibetan. Okay. 
any other Tibetans here apart from those three? All right. I'm raising my hand too. Okay, good. That's five of us. Okay, okay. Good, good. What's your name? Manushri. Manushri. Manishri. Manishri. See, I did say it. Nepalese names have <laughs> morphed into some... Manishri. Shrestha. Shrestha. Any other Shrestas here? <laughs> okay, we're only in Kathmandu Valley, right? So, hold on. Put your hands up. Put your hands up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Okay, thirteen. Any other Newars here? Okay, all right. That's another six or so. Okay. Right. Let's see. What's your name? Himanshu. Ketan. All right. What's a Ketan? Who's a Ketan? Marwaris. Any Marwaris here? One, two, three. Okay. What? There's someone else who's absent. Okay. All right. Five. That would have been five. Okay. Um, any Chetris here? Okay. All right. About ten of you. So number of Brahmins, number of Chetris, Newars. What would you call yourself? Not a Chetri, not a Brahmin. The best. <laughs> Someone who thinks highly of himself. I like that. Or herself. Not only can I, not only am I bad at recognizing and hearing Nepalese names, I'm bad at recognizing Nepalese girls as well. Terrible. Terrible. That's what does to you being away for so long from your country. That's what does to you. So, folks, don't go away. No, I'm kidding. I'll get to that later. Right. Any Yadabs in here? Any Yadabs? Do any of you know any? Shh. All right, so you know Yadabs. Does anyone here know any Yadabs? Yes. Yes. Yadab? Yes. Surname Yadab. Does anyone know any? Yes. Does anyone know any Yadabs? Yes. All right, who? Hey. Are you president? Okay. Okay. Who are they? What are Yadabs? Who are Yadabs? Anyone? Hands up. Yes. Okay, they're from the Torai. Thank you. They're the Brahmins of the Torai. So, all right. Does anyone know Pariyars? Pariyar. Yes? Who are they? What are they? You don't know. Okay, anyone know who the Pariyars are? What about Vishwakarmas? Yes. Who are they? <laughs> you just said it. <laughs> They're Dalits, yes. The Pariyars, the Pariyars and the Vishwakarmas are the Dalits. Right? No one here a Dalit, it seems. Right. I'll get back to this. Okay? But for now... Let me begin. Let me start with my talk. Right. Oh, um, in deference to our, what's your name? Subeksha. Subeksha. In deference to Subeksha. How many of you are women here? <laughs> okay. I just needed to make sure, just in case. All right. Right. Now, unlike many of you, unlike a number of you, okay, I wasn't born into privilege. Being born a Tibeto Nepalese in our country meant that considerable odds were stacked against me. That these odds may even be 
insurmountable. While I suffered in Nepal because of the circumstances and the context of my birth, they, however, did not determine my destiny. I was able to achieve my dreams. My dreams take flight. My dreams did take flight. And as a result, I achieved considerable personal and professional success. I credit that success to... Okay, now... Uh, right, I credit that success to... Firstly, to the privilege of education, both formal and informal, and secondly, to humanity. It's precisely because of that, because I've suffered and I owe my success to humanity, that I have returned to provide that same kind of privilege to the next generation of Nepalese children born into the kind of background and context I was born into. And also to inspire the next generation of Nepalese like yourselves, to dream and become agents of change in our country. This presentation is all about how I pursued my dreams and continue to pursue them, how humanity played a role in my dream-taking flight, and why I do what I do now in my efforts to make my life meaningful. I'm from the little village of Tangbe in Mustang district. Hands up if you can walk up there and if you're tall enough to point out where Mustang is. Hands up. Right, go ahead. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. That's Mustang. As a child, as a child, I lived in the little village, in our little village of Tangbe in Mustang. Hmm? Anyone here know Tangbe? You've been to Tangbe? Yes? How do you know? You've been there. From where? Mustang. Mustang. Wow, okay. What village? Which village? Uh, near Jomsom. Near Jomsom. You don't know, you don't remember? Marfa. Marfa. Okay, yeah. Marfa is just south of Jomsom. Yeah. Right, as a child, I lived in our village with my grandparents. Just like most remote villages in our country, at the time we had no indoor plumbing, no school, no phone, no refrigerators, etc. In other words, we hardly had any amenities, basic amenities. Birth as a Tibetan Nepalese, considered a low caste, as you all might be aware, and into a poor family, meant that I was not expected to make much of my life. I wasn't even expected to go to school. But my parents, who lived in Pokhara, who had no history of education, wanted me to join them so that they could send me to school. After repeated requests from my parents, my grandfather took me to the city. Living conditions in Pokhara were not much different. They weren't much better. We were five of us in a single room. After a couple of moves, we ended up in a two-room living arrangement. By that time, we were seven. We were anywhere from seven to ten members, including cousins and relatives. I was attending a government school at the time. Moving residents, I moved schools as well. A teacher 
at the third school, Bal Jyoti, I credit with starting me on this incredible journey of education and discovery about the world and humanity. Realizing that I had potential, the story goes that this teacher took my dad aside and told him, and I quote, your son has potential, but if you leave him here, nothing will become of that. Take him to Kathmandu and put him in a good school. Heeding his advice, my dad brought me to Kathmandu, and to make a long story short, I ended up at St. Xavier's Godavari School with Dinesh Sir at the foothills of Pulchoki. At St. Xavier's, I was encouraged and inspired by North American teachers to dream. They also provided me with the drive to imagine a world and life different from that in Nepal. My fifth grade teacher, Father Downing, from Cincinnati, Ohio, in the U.S., was one such teacher, from the U.S., was one such teacher. Apart from regaling us with stories of the U.S., he would bring former students, former student visitors to the school to talk to us about their lives. Many of them, either graduates or current students at universities and colleges in the U.S. As a result, as a fifth grader, I dreamt of going to the U.S. for further studies and ultimately of returning home to help children from backgrounds similar to mine. David Beeston, another North American teacher, describing how winter in Kathmandu is different from that in his hometown in Canada, said something I still haven't forgotten. And I quote, in winter, in Winnipeg, when you look out the window, all you see is white everywhere. Growing up surrounded by hills and mountains in the far off distance in Kathmandu, I was intrigued. The other drive was to be the first one from my village of Tangbei to get qualifications from educational institutions abroad. However, as the firstborn, I was under constant pressure to quit school and start working to support the family financially. Furthermore, because I was from Mustang, a bote, as we say in Nepal, as I was growing up, our society continuously reinforced its lack of belief in me. In spite of all of that, stubbornly, I stayed on and completed, stayed on in school and completed high school, becoming the first one from my entire extended family to do so. A family of five brothers and over three dozen first cousins. More than a dozen of, dozen of them older than me. Then in 1988, the next lifeline appeared. A full scholarship to the United World College of the Adriatic, as Dinesh Sir intimated earlier. One of the number of things I remember, one of the number of things I recall about my experiences at the United World College, one which always gives me a warm feeling in my heart, is the way my friends and their families made me feel special during vacations when I couldn't afford to fly home or to go on vacations to other parts of Italy or other European countries. Every single school break, my friends would invite me to, their, to stay with their families. Not only that, over winter break, for instance, the family would give me Christmas presents, just as they did their own children. An Italian family not only bought me presents, not only bought presents for myself, for me, they also bought a gift to give to a very good friend of mine as her birthday present from me. Those two years, during those two years, I was on the receiving end of incredible generosities and kindness. Also, during those two years, I met and befriended fellow students 
from all over the world, shrinking my world. Traveling a bit, I got a glimpse into the natural beauty of our planet, something I had only read about in the novels I had devoured throughout my school career here in Nepal. And it was during those two years that I came to believe that we humans of different nationalities and different cultures, practicing different religions, had more commonalities than differences. Towards the end of my UWC experience, I realized my dream of going to the US. The scholarship I'd been dreaming about since fifth grade came the spring of 1990, taking me to Grinnell College in the US. At Grinnell College, between 1990 and 1994, Again, I met some amazing people and was on the receiving end of a great deal of kindness and generosity. Graduating from Grinnell, I became the first person from my village and maybe even the whole of Upper Mustang region to get tertiary qualification from an educational institution abroad. Approaching graduation, I knew what I wanted to do, and it wasn't to return to Nepal. Not immediately anyway. The spring of 1994, my last semester at Grinnell, one late afternoon, watching the late afternoon sun setting and the sky turning different hues every several seconds, my friend Aubrey had asked, and I quote, "So." What do you want to do? I told her, and I quote, I want to go see the world. But the trouble was, I had no idea how. As luck would have it, though, my former chemistry teacher at the United World College of the Adriatic invited me back to the college. I jumped at the opportunity, and that put me on a career of teaching, traveling, and exploring the world. For most of the 20 years between 1994 and 2014, I pursued a fantastic international teaching career spanning 10 different countries. By the time I approached the end of my teaching career, I would traveled to about three dozen countries and my network of friends spanned the whole globe. I'd seen and done some amazing things in this incredible world of ours and learned a great deal about it. I'd trekked to an altitude of 5,500 meters in Nepal and scuba dived to a depth of 31 meters in the Philippines. I'd swum with wild dolphins off the coast of Zanzibar. I'd skied in the Swiss Alps, snow camped in Norway, hiked in the Dolomites in Italy. I'd gone hot air ballooning in Australia and had gone on wildlife safaris in Nepal, in Zambia, and the awesome Ngorongoro Crater and the incomparable Serengeti Plains in Tanzania. I'd learned to play the didgeridoo, ultimate frisbee, and to dance salsa and merengue. All the while, of course, I'd been planning to return home to fulfill my original dream. The only question had always been, when? In preparation for the eventual return, Ever since leaving for the first time in 1988, I'd been visiting almost once every single year. During those visits, I would make every effort to visit my hometown of Pokhara and also my village of Tangbe. In Pokhara, I would visit the streets we'd lived in and would also make every effort to visit the government schools I had attended. 
Returning often was the only way to keep myself from losing my way. My way back to the beginning, to where my life's adventure had begun. In the meantime, the educational opportunities I'd had, the professional experience I had, the travel opportunities, what I'd experienced, what I'd done, what I saw, what I'd seen, what I'd been given and rewarded with by people I'd studied, taught, worked, and traveled with. All those privileges I'd had, they'd all been beyond the wildest imagination of the 1981 fifth grade kid at St. Xavier's Godavari School, dreaming of going abroad for studies and making something of himself. Not surprisingly, therefore, even as I was doing everything I felt I needed to, to maintain my connections, my connections and ties to where I came from, those experiences would transform me into a person I hadn't imagined then. One of those important, one of the important transformations was that of thinking of, of myself as a human being first, and then everything else. All aspects of my identity, my ethnicity, my nationality, etc., coming next. What's more, countries now represent more faces, people, and humanity than political and geographical entities. The other result of my incredible in international education and travel was drawing certain conclusions about life and the world we live in. Here's one of the first ones. At the core of that is the confirmation I felt I got for my belief in compassion, a Buddhist belief, and living by its dictates. However, having been born a Buddhist in a country populated by Hindus and therefore following Hindu cultural practices and norms, while sometimes being taught by Christians at a Jesuit school, having gotten a high school diploma in a Catholic country and worked in two Islamic countries, etc., I've also realized the following about beliefs. One could make one's life meaningful by living according to a certain set of religious beliefs, but not insist or require or demand that others also believe them and live by them. Having also been born into a poor family and everything else that followed, the following is also abundantly clear to me. <coughs> and those core values are none other than kindness, generosity, and compassion. In other words, humanity. That which I came across all through my life. That which I was a beneficiary of pretty much all my life. What I have also come to realize, having experienced poverty, and having seen poverty all over the world, 
everywhere I lived and traveled is this. I met this porter on a trek to my village, somewhere between Tatopani and Zomsom, way back in the spring of 2000. The man's load was so heavy that he took maybe a step every two seconds. But because he was so poor and was paid so little, he carried his own food and cooking utensils to save as much as he could. The poorest and some of the hardest working people in our own country and on the rest of this planet have the hardest time even putting a meal, a decent meal, on the table for themselves and their children. And yet, these very people, the weakest and the most vulnerable, the poor, the marginalized and their children, are often treated the worst. I, however, have believed the following for a long time. Some of the weakest and the most vulnerable in our country are children of poor families, children of Dalits, the untouchables, children of marginalized groups such as Tamangs and Tarus, especially girls. So, in March 2013, I'd finally decided to return home for good to help vulnerable Nepalese children, children from low socioeconomic backgrounds, except I would take a detour. On May 1st, I'd be thrown in jail for allegedly insulting Islam. Unlike a number of other fellow Nepalese jailed on trumped-up charges, who had no help from anyone, on the eighth day of my own incarceration, once again, people came to my rescue. It began with friends of mine getting Doha News to publish, Doha News and Washington to Post, to publish my story. That was followed by people from all over the world coming to my rescue. Classmates and schoolmates, such as Dinesh Sir, from my former schools and colleges, colleagues from Qatar Academy, <coughs> former colleagues and friends from when I worked in other UWCs and other countries, former students, etc., came to my rescue. They rallied behind me and initiated a worldwide campaign asking the Qatari government to respect my right to due process or to release me on human rights grounds. The campaign got so big, as a matter of fact, that within four days of initiation, I was released. I returned home on May 13, after spending 12 days in jail. The reason behind my victimization, once again, had been the circumstances of my birth, being born a Nepali. The 20-month experience in Qatar in general, and the 12 days in jail in particular, was yet another lesson in pain, suffering from injustices, and redemption by humanity. But hundreds of thousands of people everywhere in many of the countries I've lived and traveled in suffer similar and other injustices all the time. In our countries, families of migrant laborers, poor families and their children, families and their children belonging to the low caste, etc., suffer from injustices all the time, of which injustices all of them, some of which are a result of either poverty or birth. Poverty, I believe, is unjust. Since returning home, 
on May 13, 2013, I've been doing what I can to right such injustices. I'm doing everything I can, both through Committed, whose chairman is also your Dinesh Shah, the organization I run with my buddy, J.G. Vhada, also another classmate of ours, at times and at times also independently. Committed helps government and community schools, schools similar to the ones I started my own academic career at in Pokhara, schools where children from low socioeconomic backgrounds attend to ensure that they have a shot at a better life than their parents. Our main project site is in the little village of Tangpalkot in the neighboring district of Sindhupalchok. The following video provides a glimpse into Raithani school in Sindhupalchok. I want to be a businessman. I want to be an engineer. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a nurse. I want to be a teacher. I want to be a doctor. We're here in Sindhupalchok at the school that you're supporting. You've just heard the dreams and aspirations of the students. But there's a huge gap between their dreams and reality. The reality is that the school doesn't have enough classrooms. For instance, this particular classroom, they have had to put two different classes together. And right now, there are over 50 students. The other issue, the other challenge here is the quality of teaching. Although the teachers themselves are highly committed, they lack experience and they lack training to help the students realize their dreams. I'm incredibly grateful for the support that you provided me thus far. I need one final push to get us past the tipping point to help the children of Sindhapalchuk achieve their dreams. Committed helps schools like Raithane with different projects, helping them acquire resources and helping them build infrastructure. The most important project, however, is that of setting up a fishery, what we call a social business for education, to generate income for the school so that it is self-sustainable. In addition to that, on the side, I'm also heavily involved in the United World College movement, alongside, I'm sure you've guessed, Dinesh sir. <laughs> Which would also be relevant to some of you gathered here today, but I'm assuming you've already been told all about it, because one of you applied. And some of you probably would qualify next year as well to apply. Ask Dinesh sir. As a member of the UWC National Selection Committee, I'm involved in the selection of the next generation of Nepalese youngsters, concentrating my efforts into encouraging children from low socioeconomic backgrounds to apply and assisting them whenever and however I'm able. For instance, last year, the candidate we selected, Iju, came from a family that could not afford the $2,500 or so in personal expenses which I fundraised from my network of friends and acquaintances around the world. She's currently a first year IB diploma student, just like you guys, at the UWC Maastricht in Holland. This year, just a little over a week ago, we completed the third and final stage of the selection process. In the next several days, we should be able to finalize a little over a dozen Nepalese UWC scholars. 
That brings me to why I do all of that. Here in Nepal, I do them for two reasons. Firstly, to ensure that those children realize their dreams and have, if even on a small scale, the kind of incredible life I've had, namely to see and learn about this marvelous world we live in and the people we share it with. Secondly, and more importantly, to ensure that they do not experience the suffering, the pain, and the injustices I have experienced, which they invariably will, especially little girls and Dalit children, if no one does anything about them. While those are the reasons for my work in Nepal, in general, I do them to promote international understanding and contribute to peace in the world. I believe our feelings for fellow human beings, our compassion and empathy for fellow human beings, our ability to see ourselves in the shoes of fellow human beings and working to alleviate them will contribute to making the world a better place, a more peaceful place, a goal of United World College education. And that brings me to you, all of you gathered here today. Having made it thus far, you have already accomplished a great deal compared to most of our countrymen. Having completed SLC, as you can see from this histogram, you are a member of a small minority of Nepalese. And once you finish your IB diploma, once you finish your IB studies, you'll be a member of an even smaller and elite group. In other words, you've had and will probably continue to have opportunities that most Nepalese don't and probably won't for quite a while still. And now, going back to the exercise I performed with you at the beginning where we looked at your composition. When I asked for your names and pointed out how many of you belong to what jat and caste, I'm sure you noticed that many of you come from very privileged backgrounds. So therefore, the network and connections you have established and will invariably continue to establish because of your priv privileged birth and privileged opportunities, you will have opportunities, connections, and power in your life that many others, other Nepalese won't. How you use those opportunities, connections, and power will be entirely up to you. My hope, however, is that you will, you will use them to make your life meaningful, just as I have tried and continue to try to do. Thank you. Now, I yield the floor back to you. Questions? It's your floor now. I know you claimed it the minute you walked in, but...